OSHA. Written by the 91st Congress of the United States. Directed by Secretary of Labor, J.D. Hudson. Assisted by Assistant Secretary of Labor, George C. Genther. The time was late 1970, and while the world, you and I, wondered breathlessly whether this was really going to change to this, our legislators in Washington had other things on their minds. Congress passed and sent to the president for his signature a bill, labeled Public Law 91-596. During the legislative process, it had been known as the Williams Steiger Act for its two sponsors. For the public, Congress concurred on the name Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. Uh, since then, it's been called a lot of things. But to most of us, it is now simply OSHA. It seemed a modest piece of legislation, and when printed, filled a 31-page booklet hardly larger than a man's hand. It seemed to say, in essence, that every employer should provide a safe place for his employees to work. No quarrel here. Oh, yes, it did mention compliance with certain standards, which would be forthcoming. But then we were already familiar with standards from other laws, like the Walsh-Healy Act, the Contract Work Hours and Safety Act, the Coal Mining Safety Act. We saw no problem here. It was not until almost five months later when the first of the new standards began to roll off the government presses that some of us began to wake up. And still they came. Hundreds of pages, thousands of standards, standards for general business and industry, whole books of standards for specific industries, and even today, it looks as though the end is not in sight. Perhaps we can show the scope of these standards from our Gone But Not Forgotten movie album. They seem to cover every subject from general housekeeping, the elimination of needless clutter and maintenance of well-defined aisles and passageways, to the allowable count of foreign particles in the air. From the proper use of ladders, on to the specifications on powered and work platforms. Plus a whole section on the design and use of scaffolds. There are standards for personal protective and life-saving equipment. There are medical and first aid requirements. And there are important standards for the guarding of machinery. A booklet with explanations and sample forms for the record keeping which would be required under the act was supposedly mailed to every business establishment. In many cases, this important book was sidetracked before top management had a chance to see these requirements. Those who did follow all this began to realize that what had seemed a modest piece of legislation was turning out to be the most extensive government involvement in the day-to-day -day operation of American business in the nation's history. Theoretically, the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 affects most of the employers in the nation. And from Washington came the word that a virtual army of inspectors was being recruited and trained to move into the field to enforce these standards. This caused a few strained eyes among business executives as they searched the fine print for possible penalties. They found them. Now, it may seem funny in the movies when the businessman is hauled into court. But in real life, no one likes to pay a fine. And certainly no one in his right mind wants to serve a prison sentence. But fines and imprisonment were very much a part of the penalties written into the law. Now, this is not to suggest that the government is going to seek prison sentences for violators with any sort of abandon, but the provisions are there. And it could happen. What are some of these penalties? Well for willful or repeated violations of the standards under OSHA, an employer may be fined up to $10,000 for each violation. The phrases may be and shall be are used throughout, denoting the degree of certainty of penalties. For a serious violation, one where there's a substantial probability that death or a physical harm could result, 
the employer shall be fined up to $1,000 for each violation. For a non-serious violation, an employer may be fined up to, again, $1,000 for each violation. For failing to correct a violation for which he has been cited within the time period permitted for the remedy, the employer may be fined up to $1,000 for each day the violation continues. For the willful violation of any standard, rule, order, or regulation under the act that causes the death of an employee, the employer shall be, upon conviction, assessed a penalty of not more than $10,000 or imprisonment for not more than six months, or both. Incidentally, in such a case, the penalty is assessed the party deemed to be responsible. It could be any supervisory employee and not necessarily the company president who feels the brunt of this one. If the conviction is for a violation committed after a first conviction, the punishment jumps to a fine of not more than $20,000 or not more than one year in prison, or both. You can't even call your warehouse across town and tell them that the company is being inspected. For that warning, you may be fined $1,000 or imprisoned for not more than six months, or both. For violating any of the posting requirements, penalties are there, as you can plainly see. For knowingly making a false statement in record keeping, the penalty is not more than $10,000 or imprisonment for not more than six months, or both. And killing an inspector can get you up to life imprisonment. It's written right there in the act. Now, how will your plant be singled out for an inspection? It could be merely routine, or the death of an employee on the job, or a serious accident where a number of employees have been hospitalized would make an inspection almost automatic. Or the inspection could have been triggered by a request from an employee or group of employees. In this event, the employee can ask that his name not be revealed. Any attempt at reprisal against such an employee can bring a federal action against the company by the Secretary of Labor. How does a compliance officer go about his job? If he goes by the book, he first studies what information he has on the company, then selects the testing equipment he knows he'll need. When he enters the establishment, he'll immediately identify himself and ask to see the manager. He presents his credentials and informs the manager that an employee representative has the right to accompany them on their tour of the plant. While the plant manager sends for his employee representative, the man from OSHA asks to see the records which are required by law to be kept available. Then, accompanied by the employee representative, who should have been chosen by employees in advance for such a contingency, the compliance officer and plant manager start on a tour of the facility. The following are some of the violations which have turned up time and again in similar inspections. Poor housekeeping, especially lack of uncluttered aisles. These gas cylinders should be secured to the wall by a chain and all fire extinguishers should be hung in plain view. It's surprising, but almost every facility still has a ladder or two which should have been retired. Electrical panel boxes must be enclosed. It's not enough to issue protective devices. Management must insist that employees use them. The officer will check environmental sound levels and want to know how many hours an employee is subjected to this noise level. In no case may the noise level exceed 90 decibels for an eight-hour exposure. There's a woefully inadequate supply of first aid materials in this kit. Pulleys, such as on this compressor, must have guards. The man from OSHA checks to see that the air pressure in this outlet does not exceed 30 pounds per square inch. This second level storage area lacks a protective railing, as does this rolling work platform. And the workman's action in climbing over, a regular part of assembly line procedure, is considered an unsafe act. All machines must have approved guards. Despite the loss of two fingers in this saw, the workman still operates without a guard. And this grinder lacks a tool rest, 
a protective device required by OSHA standards. Before he leaves, the man from OSHA will inform the plant manager what violations, if any, he has noted. The type of violation, serious or non-serious, and the recommendation of the penalty is determined after a review by the area director, solicitor, and compliance officer. If there is to be a citation, it will arrive by registered letter stating the violation, the time allotted for abatement, and the penalty. With the signing of the receipt for the registered letter, the time clock starts on abatement. And if any of you feel that this is not important, consider the case of the company which paid $138 in fines but failed to correct the violation and was fined $16,000 for the failure. Meanwhile, the company must decide whether to pay or appeal. If the decision is to pay, the government will accept a certified check or money order. The government does not like cash or personal checks. If the decision is to appeal, either the violation or the time allotted for abatement, notice of appeal must be filed within 15 working days. Otherwise, so reads the law, the citation is final and no appeal is possible. In either event, the citation must be posted near the spot of the violation. Now the construction business is a little different from a plant. The job site is usually separate from the corporate offices. If workmen report directly to the job site, it must be treated as a separate establishment with the job superintendent responsible for the same posting and record keeping as any plant or business. The inspection of a construction site is much the same as that of a plant or factory. With the employee representative, the superintendent and the compliance officer tour the job site. Among the areas peculiar to construction is trench work. Here we find men working over their heads without the protection of shoring. Since there's a great deal of temporary work in construction, there's a tendency to take shortcuts. This scaffold has an incomplete platform without tow boards and railing. As a matter of fact, violations of scaffold standards are all around us, as you can plainly see. This temporary power line on the ground and broken bulb with the wires sticking out are violations no compliance officer could overlook. And the operator of this crane is flirting with disaster among those overhead power lines. Whoops, anchors away on this one. There is a series of specifications on cables and cable splicing. These clamps were improperly installed. But the construction industry also has many of the same type of potential violations as are to be found in other areas. Housekeeping is one. This stairway is an obstacle course. The lack of a handrail is a violation in itself. And this could put a workman out of business for some time. One can still find a fire extinguisher on the ground. On closer examination, this one needed recharging. Falling is a high incident type of accident in the construction trades and OSHA standards demand that a temporary railing or cover protect all floor openings. And the perimeter of all floors must have temporary railings until closed in permanently. Protective devices are specified for many job categories. This workman is spraying fireproofing without a face mask. Even when protective devices are carefully issued, there must be a constant follow-up to make sure they are used. And used all the time. In addition to the hard hat on the ground, the man from OSHA spotted those gas cylinders on their sides. Construction work offers many opportunities for unsafe acts. High above city streets, this workman is not wearing a safety belt. As before, the man from OSHA will take time to go over these points with the superintendent before he leaves. There is one drastic action which the compliance officer may take. If he concludes that any plant or other work site contains an imminently dangerous situation, he may recommend to his superiors that action be taken in federal court to close down part or all of the establishment until the condition can be corrected. In the event such action is not taken, 
An employee injured here may seek action in federal court to force the Secretary of Labor to act. For those who speculated that these inspections would be merely routine, the first six months of enforcement provided a rude shock. Citations were issued in almost 80% of the inspections made. Many citations were issued on what is called the General Duty Clause. This states, in essence, that the employer has a responsibility to furnish a safe and healthful place of work. If, in the opinion of the compliance officer, this responsibility has not been met, even though all published standards have been complied with, he may still recommend a citation, and many have. So far, we've only discussed the employer. What about the employee? What are his duties? What are the penalties for an employee who violates a standard? The answer is that there are only three lines in the entire act which deal with this. They merely state that employees will comply with the rules and regulations of the act and standards. On the other hand, employee groups have been active since the act became law. The industrial division of a large labor organization was one of the first to take the offensive. This group established a school to train members in safety and health in order to, as one spokesman put it, police the act. Labor organizations, consumer protection groups, and various political cliques have been and are pushing for more stringent laws, additional standards, and tougher enforcement. If by now you feel that you're fighting alone, if you have the feeling that you're bucking a stacked deck, Take heart. You have allies. Among these are your insurance companies, your insurance agent or broker, your risk manager or risk management firm. Then there are the various trade associations. Safety specialists from many of these organizations have been following the currents of OSHA since it was a gleam in its sponsor's eye. And surprisingly enough, many firms have now learned that it is actually possible to turn compliance with OSHA into a corporate asset. To understand this, you must realize that Labor Department officials have made it clear that those firms which demonstrate good faith will find it much easier to work with OSHA. Experience has shown that a viable working safety program serves as an excellent demonstration of that good faith to the man from OSHA. Thus, by evaluating and improving your present safety program, or by designing one which suits the particular needs of your company, you are laying the foundation of a risk management program of loss control, a corporate asset. One of the first problems in developing an efficient safety program is the education of key personnel. In this field, there are training programs ranging from regional seminars to full college courses. Or there is another type of excellent course, such as Operation Zero, prepared by Dr. M. U. Enninger and made available at their cost by Fred S. James and Company. This type of course allows your people to study in their own time or on company time, but in either case, at their own rate of advancement. Regular examinations are graded by computer and regular reports on progress are made to management. This training program is important because a successful safety program must have management interest at every level. It is suggested that your program include these items. Above all, it should be in writing. This written program is your ammunition when the man from OSHA walks through the door. One of the most impressive items which you can show the compliance officer is a file of the on-the-job safety meetings. Who attended, what was discussed, what conclusions were reached. Part of your company's internal publication should be devoted to the safety program. Whether this is a full-blown magazine or a one-page newsletter, it should be shown to the compliance officer. It is part of that demonstration of good faith. There are several things that companies can do to ease into compliance with the law. The first of these is to make sure you have the basic information. This material should be supplemented regularly to keep it up to date. There are many sources of OSHA information. 
the Department of Labor, Bureau of National Affairs, Commerce Clearinghouse, the various insurance companies and trade associations. Self-inspection is a must. Among others, some insurance companies and the larger insurance brokers have safety experts who can help you organize a system of self-inspection. Many of these organizations are prepared to furnish experts as speakers for meetings and seminars. In addition, trade associations can offer valuable assistance in your particular business or industry. Work with them. Then, consider becoming active in those organizations which will be influential in developing future standards for your industry. Since the compliance officer is only human, it stands to reason that he will respond according to his reception. Offer him prompt, courteous treatment. Show him your written safety program and supporting evidence. Demonstrate your knowledge of the law by producing the required records and summoning your employee representative without being asked. And be sure that your bulletin board holds all required OSHA material. It should be apparent by now that no one can save you a citation. It would be a good idea to check your corporate attorneys to make sure they follow cases before the OSHA Review Commission, where precedents are being set every day. If you should receive a citation, remember you have only 15 working days to file notice of appeal. An area trial examiner will be appointed to hear all sides of the case, including that of your employees, and make his recommendation. The Review Commission will then rule upholding, modifying, or vacating the citation. The three-man body has been known to raise fines on occasion. Either side may take the case to federal court as a last resort. In addition to the appeal process, there are several forms of relief which the Secretary of Labor can grant. The first of these is an extension of time for the abatement of a violation, if you have good and sufficient reason. The second is called a variance and would permit an alternative to a standard, if the alternative provides as safe an operation as the government standard. When all is said and done, however, there are really four keys to living with OSHA. Recognize it as the law and develop a thorough knowledge of the law and standards. Maintain continuing knowledge of all changes. The second key is to develop a program of voluntary compliance, including self-inspections and a timetable for improvement. The third key is to develop a working safety program within your organization. And the final key is to operate in good faith and demonstrate that good faith to the OSHA compliance officer. Since this meeting is the only arena of contact at the field level, it's only natural that some corporate executives see the compliance officer like this. But you must realize that the compliance officer sees the corporate executive like this. Uh, really, they are both somewhere in between. And it behooves us all to try a little psychology to straighten this out. Once that is done, it may not lead to any great love affair, but it might make life livable for both sides. Why not give it a try? The next time the man from OSHA comes to call. <laughs>